everyone, I'm Megan with the I Believe Podcast. Hi, and my name is Vita Udea. I am a guest on today's episode. I am an Ayurvedic health counselor. And today we're going to talk about the role of sleep when our body is in healing and repair. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited for this topic because I feel like sleep and rest is something that we don't let ourselves do because we feel like, you know, we're being lazy or we don't deserve it or, you know, it's not productive. So I love this topic and I'm so happy you're here to help us with this. I'm very excited to be here as well. And it's it's one of my favorite topics to talk to people about because indeed, as you say, sometimes sleep feels so basic that it doesn't get the attention that it deserves, especially when we are in the process of recovery. So I'm really happy that today we're shining the light on that. Absolutely. So tell me, what is Ayurveda? Because I've never heard of this until we spoke. So Ayurveda is, some of your listeners might be familiar with yoga already. Yoga and Ayurveda are actually sister sciences. So Ayurveda originated about, people say, about 5,000 years ago in what is India, in, in that area. And it is literally translated as the knowledge, the science of life. So whereas yoga helps us, you know, calm down the noise in our minds so we can feel more peaceful, what Ayurveda does, it's sister science, it's like the medicinal sister. So Ayurveda helps us get to know our body and helps us take care of our body so that it can be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So this is what Ayurveda does, and that's why I love it so much. <laughs> that's so fascinating. So how did you get into it? How did you find it? I came across, Ayurveda came into my life back in 2018. I had just had my second baby, and I was going through some health challenges and personal challenges myself, and then... I discovered it through a podcast, actually, with a podcast that I still listen to today. And I kind of binged, listened to all the episodes I could find because suddenly something clicked because it was like, it, it was making so much sense to me. You know, a lot of I is about living in accordance with the laws of nature, which we kind of over time become disconnected from. And so I found that connection there that I think I was lacking and, and unconsciously seeking. So right after I came across that podcast, I dove straight into Ayurveda studies. And back then, I was working in the field of European politics, so something really completely different. And uh, several years of study, two years ago, I managed to make a complete career U-turn. And so now I am working with people as an Ayurvedic health counselor, which is so joyous for me. Oh, I bet. That's so great when you can make a career out of something that you're passionate about and you love. I mean, that's so rare and special. And I, I mean, I wish everybody could have that. Yeah, it's it, it, it's very special. If, if you know, if, once you find that spark, then you should really follow it because... If you do, even if it's challenging in many ways and it it means that you have to make many very uncomfortable decisions in your life, which which can be, you know, scary and but it's just really, really worth it. It's scary to try anything new, especially when it's not a known quantity of like, oh, I will do this and this is the outcome when you just jump in. But it, that's how I feel like we find the greatest things that are the most rewarding is by just taking that leap of faith and going for it. So I'm, I'm excited that it worked out and you're here to talk to us today. So today we're talking about the role of sleep in the process of healing and why you should focus on sleep while you're dealing with any diagnosis, but ocular melanoma specifically. So tell us about that. In Ayurveda, we're working a lot with, with a person's lifestyle. So we are looking at how they are living their life, what they're doing every single day what they're eating every single day, how they're sleeping every single day, and how they're spending the energy that they get from sleep and from food, in what ways they're spending it. Are they spending too little? Are they spending too much? And so on. So sleep is one of the main pillars of health and wellness in Ayurveda. 
So it's the pillar of health that everything else kind of stands on. So that's why when I start working with someone, that is going to be one of the first pieces that we're going to look at together. How is that person sleeping? And if they're not sleeping, even if they have whatever symptoms they might be experiencing, we will be circling back to the quality of their sleep. And in fact, now I think it's about like, it's thousands and thousands, I think like 17,000 studies have been done on sleep in conventional medicine. So it, it is a subject of interest to science as well. And they've discovered that it's the single most effective thing that we can do every day to reset our brain and our body's health. So this is really an incredible thing to, to think about and to integrate into our mindset for everyone, but especially if we're dealing with a health challenge. Because if we're, we're told by science, they're able to measure that, you know, it's the thing, it's more important than eating right. If somebody is at a point in their life where they feel like their sleep is a mess, their diet is a mess, they have no energy, everything is going wrong. If they just focus on the sleep piece, that can really help to kind of get everything going, you know, in the upward spiral again. As we said, it's something so basic, but it's something that is incredibly powerful for everyone, you know, but especially if somebody's dealing with, with a health challenge. Science now says that there isn't a single biological function that doesn't benefit from good sleep, right? So even if we're faced with a scary diagnosis and we are anxious about it, you know, thinking what is to be done by me? What can I do about it? You can start getting good night's sleep. That is going to be one of the best things that you can do for yourself and for your body's repair and healing. There is a great book by a PhD scientist called Matthew Walker. It's called Why We Sleep. I really recommend it to anyone who has disturbed sleep and who would like to explore this further. This is a really, really good resource. It's also written in a really user-friendly way, so it has a lot of science in it, but it's, it's digestible. That would be a really good place to start digging if some of your readers are interested oh i love that thank you that's such a that's a great resource i always love a book on anything but especially something that can actually be helpful to us that's awesome let's talk about the link between sleep and anxiety how does that work i haven't come across any modern science examining the, the link between the two. I'm sure that exists. I'm positive. If there are like 17,000 studies done on sleep. I'm sure some of them will be linked to anxiety. But from the Ayurvedic perspective, when we're speaking about an Ayurvedic perspective, this is a perspective that ancestors of humanity thousands and thousands of years ago noticed what happens in a human body, right? And what are the patterns that can be observed? And what they observed, so this is written in Ayurvedic texts, the more anxious a person will be, the more trouble their sleep is likely to be. So there's this link between the more anxiety you will feel, probably the worse you will sleep, right? And it goes the other way yeah, around as well. If, if you are somebody who feels peaceful most of the time, you are more likely to have a good night's sleep. This is also an interesting link between the two for the listeners because if you are at a point in your life where you're feeling very anxious, right, and you're finding that your sleep is very disturbed, you know that you, you only need to pick one thing. Like you can either focus on the anxiety piece or you can focus on the sleep piece and as you work on one, the other will improve too. So how can you work on it? Like what are some examples of things people can do in their lives to, you know, say someone has a diagnosis and they are struggling with this, easier said than done. What can they do? As general advice, right? Because Ayurveda is, it takes a personalized approach always. So we always look at a person as a whole, what is going on in their life and in their body this very moment. But as a general 
guideline. If someone is experiencing a lot of anxiety, the first thing that I would look at is how much caffeine are they also consuming? And so that is probably one of the easiest ways to bring the anxiety down because caffeine is a nervous system stimulant. So it and anxiety is stimulation of, of the mind, right? When we're anxious, our mind is stimulated because we're always projecting these scenarios like a ping pong ball in your head. So in Ayurveda, yeah. we look at qualities of what what is happening in the body so anxiety is the quality of movement of stimulated movement of thoughts and so what other things in your life give you stimulation what other other things are you consuming during the day for example that have the same effect because like attracts like yeah and opposites create balance this is like the law of nature in a way caffeine is probably the first where i would look and it's incredible how many people consume way more caffeine than they are aware of caffeine is not only in coffee caffeine is also in dark chocolate Caffeine is also in green tea, black tea, even decaf will have like 30% caffeine. Without being aware of it, it can really build up in our body. And then caffeine in an adult person has a five hour half-life. So it means to eliminate a caffeine that will be present in a coffee cup completely, we need 10 hours. A cup of coffee in the afternoon, by the time we need to go to bed, there's still this stimulation of the nervous system that is present in our body. There's still that stimulating effect. Mm. It's not about being guilty though. Some people handle caffeine better than others. It's usually people who have a bit more like body mass, they're more stable, they have a larger frame. Usually they will be less anxious. They will have less of this anxiety tendency. For some people, caffeine can be a medicine. But that being said, if we're experiencing anxiety, that is probably what is firing it up even more, you know, not taking into account the outside, the circumstances. The second thing I would say, regardless of whether we're working with anxiety or with sleep, in both cases, having a regular schedule, a regular schedule for eating and sleeping is super helpful when it comes to sleep, health, but also it helps to bring down anxiety. In Ayurveda, actually, when we treat anxiety and poor sleep, the remedies are very, very similar because we're actually treating the same root cause, which is too much movement, the quality of movement. So ideally, the bedtime would be 10 p.m. For good sleep hygiene, that is when our body, if, we're, if we manage to sleep by 10 p.m., then that is when our body can benefit from the most deep sleep cycles because we experience our body goes through deep sleep and then REM sleep cycles and and then it kind of like it's kind of this like wave like movement throughout the night and we will see that the first four hours of the night so from 10 p.m to about 2 a.m that is when we have the highest concentration of deep sleep then afterwards the sleep the second part of the night our sleep becomes lighter so that's when we have more dreams, you know, other processes take place. But in it's in the deep sleep state that our body is best at repairing and regenerating. So that's incredibly important for anyone with health. It's, it, it's important for everyone, but especially if we're dealing with health challenges. That would be that would be the, the second piece that I would advise people. So checking how much coffee you're having throughout the day doesn't mean you know, that you have to cut it all out. In fact, if somebody is very used to having a lot of coffee, like three cups of coffee per day, and if they suddenly go off it, it can create, you know, withdrawal symptoms. It can create agitation, extra agitation in the body because that's a very sudden change. Any kind of sudden change can create agitation. So, you know, phasing it out, maybe first making like half a cup less, you know, or replacing it with an alternative, especially in the afternoon, and then gradually phasing it out. 
and then looking at what time are you going to bed, right? What is what is your evening routine? Are you allowing your nervous system to wind down? Because our nervous system also needs like a buffer, you know, to mm-hmm. go from from like high functioning working brain into a relaxed brain. It's not like a non and off switch. So we need to also foresee a couple of hours in the evening where we reduce our screen time, right? Where we do something relaxing, whatever that, that, that can be different for everyone. You know, everyone will relate to different practices, but things like taking a bath, reading a book, you know, going for a walk, hopefully not doing some kind of intense activity. So either physical intense workout right before bed or like anything that is intellectually intense or emotionally intense, you know, thinking of your evening, like a couple of hours before your bedtime as like this buffer zone for your nervous system and seeing what practices resonate with you. What do you enjoy doing that brings you the feeling of peace? Um, Definitely looking at screen use in the evening because we know already also that there are studies that blue light, exposure to blue light, it kind of messes up with our hormones, especially melatonin. There are ways that you can make your phone less attractive. There's a setting that makes it all dark and unattractive to look at (laughs) in the evening, especially in the winter. Now we use our lights less. The lights that you have in the house after dark, that they're nervous system friendly. For people who who really are struggling with insomnia, Mm -hmm. I would really recommend also looking like you, you can film your light with your phone through your camera and see mm-hmm. in the recording if it flickers. Sometimes we won't be able to notice that with a naked eye, but our nervous system notices it. So if you have flickering lights in your rooms uh, where you spend your evenings, you know, that's something you could look at. There are special light bulbs that you can get as well that are more nervous system friendly so that's fascinating so if your light if you look at your light through your phone and it flickers what kind of lights are those are those like the kind of like the new energy saving ones or they're probably the more likely ones to flicker so fluorescent lights i'm not an expert in lights but definitely if they flicker they will agitate our nervous system in a way that we can't perceive some people it it might be fine like for, for people who in general are sensitive so you know going through a lot of anxiety or not sleeping well that is an additional an additional thing that they could look at i think it would be probably lead lights but don't quote me on that yeah that actually that makes a lot of sense we can do a little research into that and maybe see if we can do like a follow-up with something on lights because i've never heard of this so this to me is fascinating this is Definitely something that we could look into a little more. There is a lamp shop that I drive past every time I go to my grocery store. When I drive by, there is a camera on my car. I can see, like when I drive past, when I look at that shop through the camera, it's going in all directions. It's like flickering like crazy. And it's a room full of, you know, pretty lamps. And so I'm thinking like for the people working there, I, I wonder how they're sleeping. Oh, you just blew my mind. Because that's happened before where I've taken a you know a video and yeah, you see the light bulbs flashing and you can't see it to the naked eye, but in a video you can. That is really fascinating. I'm going to go like film all my light bulbs now. Starting with these three things, monitoring your caffeine intake, checking your bedtime and seeing how you're using your evening time. Are you using it to get more stuff done? Or are you is other things that you can do to help yourself wind down? Then checking your blue light exposure and light bulb exposure. I mean, we, we have mm-hmm. evolved over millennia. We were living in tune with natural rhythms. And so what happens, what happens when the sun goes down? Our body technically should not be exposed to light or any bright light. That, in general, helpful for our health. It's going to be helpful for sleep. It's going to be helpful overall because this is how our bodies evolved. And the same goes for for digestion. Our digestion also follows the rhythm of the sun. We can digest the most. Our digestion is strongest at lunch. 
when the sun is highest in the sky. If we consume the most of our food at lunch, that's when we digest it the most. And often what happens nowadays is that people would have lunch on the go, having a snack or something, and then have a big meal at dinner, which can also sometimes disrupt sleep. Because at dinner, it's like our digestion capacity goes down, just like the sun. That's another thing for sleep health. Checking when are you having dinner? Are you leaving enough hours? So maybe leaving a good buffer of three hours before you're going to sleep. That For me, that's a big one. I tend to eat more of my food in the middle of the day. I don't eat dinner very often. Mm -hmm. And when I do eat dinner, especially a later, bigger dinner, I don't sleep near as well. But when I go to bed on more of an empty stomach, I always sleep so much better. So that is something that I try to do. And I have I can tell a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, for mm -hmm. me, it's the same. And that's because our body, so especially during this time from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., that is when our body is doing a different kind of digestion, according to Ayurveda. So it's not supposed to be digesting food, right? That's supposed to have already gone through. And during this time, it's digesting life. It's digesting our experiences. It's compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing, you know, what happened to us during the day, sorting out our memories, sorting out our stories. And that is also the time when, since that's when we are supposed to be in deep sleep, that is the time when most of the body regenerative processes happen. So mm -hmm. those processes, they will be impaired if our stomach is full, because then our body yep. needs to multitask. We know that multitasking doesn't really work because you end up not doing any of the tasks well. So yes. <laughs> you neither digest you well, you feel heavy <laughs> in the morning, and you neither repair well. So oh, yeah. that's another thing that people can look at to sleep better. Definitely. And that is, I think, very true. We could do a whole episode on just eating windows, I feel like, because especially when you are trying to heal yourself and you're going through something like that, there are so many studies on when the restorative processes happen in your body after eating. You know, there's different hour marks, and I don't have them all memorized, but I've read it a ton of times where at this hour, since you've stopped eating, this process starts. And then at this hour mark, this process starts. And to get into that deep, healing restorative state you have to be fasted for quite a few hours so the normal you know for like obviously we're in america so for us like that normal american eating schedule where you're eating at like 6 7 p.m at night you're never going to get to that phase yeah i mean also it depends how much you eat right so indeed this this could be this could be a whole other episode whether we do yep. or not like digestion is so sleep is huge. Digestion is also huge. These are like, you know, the two things. But indeed, measuring, there are actually physiological ways to measure what your perfect portion should be. So th there, there are ways that you can, that you can like get a sense of how much can I actually eat so that I don't feel heavy afterwards or that it doesn't disrupt my sleep and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, I think not completely in line with that because it is sort of a whole nother issue, but somewhat in line with that is alcohol. If you, you know, especially as we age, if we drink alcohol, a lot of times it wakes us up in the middle of the night and there's the whole <laughs> chemical process that's happening that is waking us up. So if that happens to you, you're not the only one. It's not a weird you thing. That is actually, that's all of us. It, it is a chemical process process that wakes you up around like 2 a.m. That's another thing that we could do is, you know, cut back on the alcohol or skip it. Matthew Walker talks about in, in that book, Why We Sleep, as a very simple one pager of like good sleep hygiene. So this is going to be not from the Ayurvedic perspective, from the scientific perspective, but they're actually super, super similar. And he also talks about alcohol quite, quite extensively there and, and the effects that it has on sleep on caffeine. Also, he has quite some discussions. I would really, really recommend this book. I, I use it a lot. I read it several times. And yeah, it, it's really good. So how much sleep do we need? Um, so from the scientific perspective, they say between seven and nine hours, but they don't say who should have seven, who should have eight, and who should have nine hours. From the Ayurvedic perspective, we do advise who should have seven, who should have eight, and who should have nine. 
in general, how much sleep a person needs will depend on their body type. No one should be getting less than seven, that's for sure. If you're getting less than seven hours per day, per night, you are sleep deprived. You're in sleep, you're running up sleep deficit. From the Ayurvedic perspective, in general, People who will be needing the most sleep, so nine hours, will be people who are experiencing anxiety, going through major changes, who already have a disrupted sleep, people who tend to lose or gain weight in short amounts of time. So it's in general a person, there is less stability to them and to their body. They are either going through circumstances that are destabilizing them or their body is going through some, or their body is depleted. So somebody who has has experienced burned out and now they're, they have like chronic fatigue or, or depletion and so on. So these are the, the types of people who would be the types of adults, because we're talking about adults here, who would be recommended to have the most sleep. As a general rule, if we're in recovery of health, we can have more and we should have even more than nine hours if we are feeling compelled to. People who can do with seven hours of sleep would be typically the the, the kind of person that I discussed when we when we we're talking about coffee. People who will have like a larger frame, heavier weight, and in general for them it's really difficult to get going in the morning. So they have this tendency to oversleep and they, they love lounging. They are like less inclined towards physical activity. So there we see that we're trying to bring in opposites to create balance, right? So when when somebody is has more of this heavy quality in the mind and the body, we can have them on seven hours of sleep. That's fine. But, you know, if, if you aim for like, eight or nine that's that's already and it's probably much better than the majority of the population just as some extra motivation for people to to take this really seriously now there is science that shows so for example they did this experiment where they had people on six hours of sleep per night for one week in a lab and they tested their genetic expression so the genetic code they noticed starts to change after one week of getting just six hours of sleep. So that's crazy. Um, the certain segments of the DNA molecule, you know, we have like very long strands and only certain segments will be activated and expressed at certain times. And so they found that after only one week of having somebody on six hours of sleep, the segments that were in relation to chronic inflammation, um, the part of the DNA molecule that starts to give orders to our cells, the ones that increase are the ones that we don't want happening in our body. And so the ones that were related to good metabolism and good immunity start to be expressed less. So that is very important to realize that, you know, when we are lacking sleep, our immunity is directly affected pretty fast. Like after one week, you can actually measure that in terms of, you know, genetic expression and the activity of, of our immune, immune cells. So I think that's, that's really important to illustrate that, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a serious topic, very basic, but so, so, so important. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. It's fascinating. The, and, you know, I mean, everything is all our bodies and, you know, we, we're trying to find this harmonious balance, but I think so many people just kind of get sucked into their day-to-day -day grind and they forget to check in with their body and see how are they feeling and you know like one of the things that I try to do is I try to drink a lot of water in the earlier part of the day mm -hmm. so that I'm not thirsty and drinking a lot before bedtime so that's a conscious thing I do yeah. but I haven't always done that and there are days that I'm busy and I don't drink a lot and then I, I realize I'm thirsty in the evening and I drink a ton of water and then I'm up half the night so you know even something like that just listening to your body cues knowing when you're thirsty drinking early in the day you know, all of the things that we can do that if we just like took the time to check in with our body and listen we could probably be a lot better at just picking up our own cues 
Yeah, actually, one of the first exercises, one of the first homework that I give to my clients is to fill in like a wellness journal where they, for a week or so, they're noting down everything they're eating, when they're eating, when they're going to bed, and then how they're feeling either right after or the next day. And pretty soon people notice that certain types of foods make them feel a certain way, you know, or when they prioritize certain things over, for example, sleep, what happens the next day, you know? So yeah, absolutely. And this is just one way, like, you know, documenting on a piece of paper can be a tool to do that. But as you say, just like, listening to to your body you know and noticing the cause and effect you know checking in with yourself after you have had a heavy dinner the next morning how do i feel and then hopefully registering that and allowing that to influence your decisions in the future yeah absolutely and i always wake up puffy like a marshmallow and i i can feel it before i get out of bed i open my eyes and i can feel that heaviness in my eyelid and I know. Oh, why did I do that? Well, thank you so much for being on and talking to us. That was actually super informative. And I feel like I got a lot out of it. I can't wait to check out that book. And where can we find you if we want to check out your stuff? Sure. So the best place to find me is probably my website, which is spelled L-E-A-N-O-N-A-Y-U-V-E. Ga.com. And there you can read a bit more about my story and, and about the program that I have. And then I'm also on Instagram where I share some recipes and family stuff. And it's, it's the same handle, Lean on Ayurveda. So these are the main two places where I hang out. Awesome. Well, we will link those in the show notes so everyone can find you. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. I know it's hard with us being in different continents. So thank you for making it work. And we really appreciate that you took the time to be with us and share all your knowledge. And to everyone out there watching, thank you for tuning in because we cannot do this without you. The fact that you are here watching or listening, subscribe, please. If you want more content like this, all you have to do is follow along, like, subscribe, share, and we are happy to bring you more. So thank you so much. You can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. You can check out our Tuesday night Zoom meetings if you want to connect with other fellow Omis that have. And you can go to 5Ks. We have a lot of 5Ks coming up. So there is so much going on in our community. Please come and find us. Join our Facebook group. Find us online, anywhere. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We would love, love, love to have you join us. So until next time, we will see you. Have a great week. Bye, everyone. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.